Well, here we are. It's been months since Halo 5 came out, and I know you've all been waiting to hear my in-depth thoughts on Halo 5's story and lore. However, before we go any further, we need to do a bit of an upgrade. Much, much better, I think you'll all agree. So, with that all out of the way, let's dive into Halo 5's story, lore, and to a lesser extent, the marketing campaigns. To be specific, we'll look at exactly how they tie into Halo 5's story. I'll touch very lightly on whether they were hinting at what we got, but at the end of the day, I firmly believe we weren't lied to, at least no more than we were by any other marketing campaign. With that all said, let's get into the meat of Halo 5. I gave the campaign a 9 out of 10, and while I stand by that, more or less, the story isn't nearly as compelling. It's no Halo 4 in terms of narrative, which, if you don't know, I gave a 7 out of 10. But it's still good. From here on out, it's spoiler territory. No spoiler-free wrap-up or anything, just a full-on, in-depth discussion of the story, the intel, the marketing campaigns, and any other Halo 5-related stuff I decide to bring up. Basically, if it came out in 2015, there's a decent chance that we'll be discussing it. If there's something from that year that you don't want even mildly spoiled, I suggest you avoid the video. Alright, we good? Good. Last thing, as the title suggests, this is going to be a multi-part series. With everything that we'll be discussing, it kind of has to be. At the moment, we're looking at maybe four or five parts, but it honestly depends. We'll play it by ear. Anyway, with everything out in the open, let's talk Halo 5. Now, before we get into the campaign, let's talk about Hunt the Truth Season 1, which takes place in the months, or at least some weeks, before Halo 5. Without getting into too much detail, the story follows Benjamin Giroux, who was hired by Michael Sullivan of Oni Section 2 to write a profile on John 117, the Master Chief. Over the course of his investigation, Ben uncovers the true origins of the Master Chief and the Spartan 2 program, and starts making his discoveries public. Eventually teaming up with an insurrectionist leader named Pharaoh, secretly an Oni agent, he uncovers some rather unsavory events that occurred on Biko that also shine a fairly negative light on the Chief. Eventually, with Pharaoh's help, he's able to hack into a UEG Senate hearing and relate all of these findings to the Senators. Now, whether this was originally part of Oni's plan or just something Oni came up with to make the best of their situation, Oni discredited Ben's discoveries by compromising his sources and then took the story of the cover-up on Biko and rebranded it as an example of the Chief's heroism. What began as a profile on the Master Chief to give Oni an official backstory for him evolved into a test to gauge public reaction to the Chief going rogue. And as we hear in the audio drama, the reaction wasn't great. Fast forward a bit, and we arrive at late October in 2558. Five UNSC colonies have been hit by an unknown forerunner attack, and Dr. Halsey, former head of the Spartan 2 program and current war criminal, claims to know why. Oh, what's that? How does she know? Hell if I do. <laughs> it's never hinted at in any, and I mean any, of the pre-Halo 5 media or marketing. Oh, oh, it's that you, you think maybe it's connected to the Janus key or the absolute record? WRONG! Yeah, Halo Escalation covered those topics, but like some <clears throat> other events in that series, they may as well have never happened. But in all seriousness, while the comics were a major letdown in terms of resolving Spartan Ops' story and hinting at Halo 5's, there's a reason for Halsey knowing the source of these attacks. That source is Kamchatka, the planet that serves as the setting for the opening level in Halo 5. In the weeks prior to the game's start, Kamchatka's communication hub came alive, attracting the attention of the UNSC and Jewel's Covenant. Jewel and company went down there, and Halsey discovered hints at the coming Guardian Awakening and the reason behind it. Kamchatka also saw the Prometheans suddenly turn on Jewel, further weakening his Covenant and calling into question his title as the Didax Hand. Seems your fingers are an open rebellion, Han. Enough! So now, the UNSC has decided to try and recover Dr. Halsey, sending the recently formed Fireteam Osiris to get her and there is a lot to say about Osiris. For me personally, I enjoyed the various personalities and backstories, especially Vale and the return of fan favorite, Buck. Vale has some major moments later in the game that have endeared her to fans, such as myself, and Buck is played by Nathan Fillion. What, that's, that's pretty much it. What else is there to say? Tanaka and Locke, on the other hand, didn't grow on me quite as much, but both are fairly well-rounded characters, in my opinion. Tanaka really comes out during later levels that expound on her character history and shows why she was selected to be part of Osiris. Locke, as we know from Nightfall, is an asset recovery specialist. While he came off as somewhat abrasive in the marketing material, he has shown to be quite the Boy Scout at times. He's respectful when he needs to be, but as the marketing has shown, he can be stern when the situation calls for it. Overall, I think Osiris were fairly well-rounded characters that, while lacking in any real development, 
felt like real people. And on the subject of development, let's talk about that. People have lambasted 343 for the lack of character development in this game. While we will talk about Blue Team later, now's a perfect time to talk about Osiris. Let's be clear, you do not need character development to tell a good story, especially when the characters in question aren't the main characters. Now yes, the majority of Halo 5's campaign is spent on Osiris, but they are never the focus. The focus is always on Blue Team in the grand scheme and the mission in the immediate. Again, we'll talk about Blue Team in good time, but I think the fact that Osiris technically don't grow as characters in Halo 5 works for the story being told. They have no reason to grow, they are only there to allow us, the player, to experience the story. We'll talk about this again as we get closer to the end of the game, I think you guys know the moment I'm referring to, but until then, let's get back to the opening mission. Osiris lands on Kamchatka and mows through waves of Covenant and Prometheans like 80s badasses, and boy is it glorious. As you fight your way through the level, dialogue and mission intel helps explain what's going on and why. We also get a bit of backstory on Vale and the new Promethean look. The thing with Halo 5 is to take your time. If you don't bull rush through the levels, you are rewarded with small details that explain things you might not otherwise know. Anyway, after fighting their way through Covenant and Promethean forces, the Spartans take out Julem Dama and recover Dr. Halsey. So, let's talk about Jewel. He was a major figure in Spartan Ops, and a fairly important character in Halo the Thursday War and Halo Escalation. Many fans had grown attached to him and were fairly disappointed at his death, to put it lightly. E extremely lightly. And I won't deny that initially, I was very much in agreement with what seems to be the majority opinion. However, after thinking about it for a while, I'm not so sure how I feel anymore. I mean, looking at all the media Jewel is actually featured in, He's a fairly flat and boring character. I feel sorry that he lost his wife because of Oni's mission to manufacture a Singhili civil war and whatnot, but beyond that I don't really feel much for him. He wanted revenge against humanity and that's it. It wasn't very interesting and his lack of involvement in Halo 4's main campaign really didn't help. So how do I feel at the end of the day? I don't disagree that more could have been done with Jewel, be it his death or his character in general but I'm not so sure it was as bad a call as I once thought. And one last thing I have to address, I've seen people suggest that 343 should have made him a boss battle if nothing else, but I'm sorry, I just can't agree with that. Jewel canonically was not much of a warrior, they say as much in the level. Any boss battle likely would have been boring and underwhelming, or for lack of a better phrase, not very Halo. Well, actually... Oh. Oh. Maybe it would have been more Halo than I'm willing to admit. So, with Halsey in custody, she is brought to the Infinity. Upon seeing Captain Lasky, she demands to know what took so long before she's dragged off by Palmer. Not in a bad way, mind you, Palmer has changed for the better in this game, even if the reasons why are total bullshit. The second level introduces us to Blue Team as they prepare to infiltrate the Covenant-held Argent Moon, a once-lost Oni research station. In the Pelican cockpit, we see the Master Chief, John, mourn the loss of Cortana. With a single gesture, we get the most powerful expression of this loss throughout the game. Meanwhile, in the troop bay, Blue Team prepares for deployment. Fred expresses his concern over the Chief, while Kelly insists he's fine. Again, a strong indicator of the damaged state Cortana's death left him in. As John parks the Pelican and joins his team for deployment, Fred personally asks John if he's okay, and John insists that he is. And then, Blue Team, to the classic Halo theme, deploys. Pausing again, I have to give serious props to the cinematics team for Halo 5. The opening cinematic and the opening to Blue Team do a wonderful job at demonstrating the differences between the Spartan 2s and Spartan 4s by taking advantage of the visual medium available to them. Osiris is a lot of spectacle, very fast paced and action oriented. Blue Team on the other hand is very subdued and practical in their approach. It creates this wonderful dichotomy between the two Spartan classes. Sadly, it isn't quite taken full advantage of during gameplay or in later levels. It's there, but it's never expressed quite as well as it is when you look at these two cinematics. Anyway, once on board Argent Moon, Blue Team goes to work clearing out the local Covenant forces, hoping to recapture the Oni Station. Not long after boarding, Blue Team is ambushed by a hunter, and John is separated from them. During what is basically a dream sequence, he encounters Cortana, who informs him that... The domain is open. Meridian is next. The reclamation is about to begin. 
before finding himself next to his fellow Spartans. He mentions his vision of Cortana, but quickly refocuses Blue Team on the mission at hand, something I absolutely love. John is a professional soldier. He would not dwell on this during the mission. I wouldn't mind a little dwelling post-mission, but, you know, oh well. Anyway, after clearing out more Covenant, reinforcements suddenly show up, seemingly fresh off the death of Jewel and Dama, which is mentioned in the level itself. With such an overwhelming force present, Blue Team has but one choice. Overload the station's reactor and destroy it. And again, I have to pause and praise the game's designers. Traditionally, when it comes to blowing up reactors in Halo or sci-fi in general, it's push a button and you're good. In the case of the UNSC, they seem to have some contingencies in place so a disgruntled employee with access can't just blow up the whole station. Anyway, after destroying the reactor's cooling system and taking out even more Covenant, Blue Team heads up to the hangar, takes out more Covenant, then prepares to leave. As they do, John contacts Infinity to inform them of the potential contact with Cortana and his intent to pursue. When Infinity denies his request, saying that they are aware of the problem and have someone else on it, the Chief decides to go AWOL. Naturally, Blue Team, being his fellow Spartans, basically his family, goes with him. They won't court-martial all of us, right? And that pretty much wraps up this level. Well, on the surface. Like every level, this one has intel that helps explain the backstory. By finding this intel, you can discover what Argent Moon was doing, why it was abandoned, and why it took so long to find. The station was developing a bioweapon because... Oni. But protocol wasn't properly followed, and the disease broke out. Though the station AI Roker attempted to contain the outbreak, he ultimately failed and the entire crew was dead within weeks. With little choice and the air full of disease, Roker made a recording to warn anyone who might find the station and put it on a course that would avoid major settlements while allowing him to dump bodies along the way. Then, on September 12, 2557, Roker initiated final dispensation, ending his life. It's a very nice backstory and the idea of an AI having to basically commit suicide really hit me when I listened to this. Now, while Blue Team, the level, excels with the intel, it kind of fails on the dialogue side. While it does a decent job of painting Blue Team as a family, I was seriously caught off guard the first time John called Fred, Frederick. I honestly can't recall a single instance in prior fiction where Fred was ever called by his full name, let alone by John. And further from a narrative perspective, we never learn how Blue Team exists. I mean, lore fans will know, but the general audience, who have been told from day one that John is the last Spartan 2, they are seriously going to be thrown for a loop by the sudden appearance of more Spartan 2s. Even some clunky exposition would have been welcome. It's not like it's alien to Halo. While the Covenant had us locked up in here, I overheard the guards talking about this ring world. They call it Halo. One moment, sir. Accessing the but, generally speaking, we are off to a good start with Halo 5. Still, we have a lot of ground left to tread. Join me next time as we talk all things Meridian. Until then, this has been Halo Cannon. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you, profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.